everybody. So it's Holy Week, and uh, it's a little later in the day. Time sort of, uh, time just always a little different on, on Holy Week. Uh, and this morning, I, w I attended a funeral mass for a lovely woman, uh, Mary, uh, who died. She was actually a pilgrim with us on our Holy Land trip to uh, just a, a month and a half ago. And she came back and discovered she had this severe cancer and um, she died last week. And so actually out of the 46 pilgrims we took, uh, 20 of them showed up for the, for the funeral today and it was out of town for almost all of them. So, um, but mainly sympathy to the, to the family. Um, I uh, was thinking of her, I was, I was watching, one of the things I was going to mention was uh, I was flipping, I was on Netflix the other day and the movies we think you'll like, you know. Um, I watched a Polish movie called Corpus Christi right at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I think it might, might have remembered that I watched that because it said, watch the film Johnny. It's another po Polish movie about a priest who has lots of physical challenges and things. And he, but he's really, um, he's good at reaching out and connecting with, I don't know, marginal people, people that other people don't pay that much attention to. So he'd be good in like in prisons. Um, and uh, there's one guy who just got out of prison and he volunteers at this hospice, a place for people who are dying that this priest has started, you know, and it's, a lot of the movies about the relationship between those two guys. Um, good movie though, it's right on Netflix, it's free if you have Netflix. Um, but I, I thought I'd just share something, it's kind of starting out right on a kind of a heavier topic, but I think this Lent, you know, we were really graced to have at St. James, uh, Pam come to us for our parish mission to talk to us about faith and keeping hope alive in the midst of suffering, you know. And so here um, in, this, in this film, the, the priest suffers a lot. He's with people that are suffering a lot. And, and he, he takes the stage on a talk show. He's become sort of a national figure, I guess. I didn't quite finish the movie. So if the last seven, eight, ten minutes of the movie are awful, I'm sorry I recommended it. But I think it's good. And a really good friend of mine watched it and said it was excellent. So... Um, Anyway, they had him on stage and they said, you work with hospice people, you yourself have brain cancer and are told you have six months to live. Um, what, do you, what do you advise people to say to people who have loved ones who are sick or perhaps are terminally ill? What should we say to them? And I'll just read it. I copied down and I transcripted the, the dialogue before I came over today. I'm in the upstairs of the parish center, by the way. Uh, if you ever want to come up here and check out this icon room, it's, those are all icons I've acquired over the years. And uh, it's a nice place. The staff prays here once a week. Um, anyway, so they ask him, what should we say to our um, friends or family members, loved ones who are uh, suffering terribly, maybe dying? And it's a little bit long, but let me just kind of read this. He says, well... We uh, who are sick and we who are dying, uh, we don't expect you to comfort us, to constantly pat us on the head saying, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. We need a different message from you. We need to hear you say, don't be afraid. Whichever way this thing goes, I'll stand by you. I'm not going to leave because I love you. And then he goes on. But in order for you to be able to say that, you have to work on it. Work on it your whole life. You'll need to, you'll need to make an effort especially when our personal relationships are difficult. He goes on, nothing, I repeat, nothing relieves us of our obligation to nurture the relationships we have with the people we love the most. Time, time is the most precious thing we have. It's the most precious thing we can give 
to each other, our private time. So he says that, and then the, the crowd in the arena stands and erupts in applause. He really touched their hearts. It's good stuff, isn't it? It gets a little more heady as you go, but I think that second part is, is it's not just saying the right thing. It's being people that, like you said, you gotta make an effort your whole life. Um, what is, how does he phrase it? He didn't say to do what, but I think it's just to be, um, to say loving things, to be able to, I thought he was gonna go a different way. I was thinking you have to make an effort if you're gonna help people in their pain, you have to make an effort to not run away from your own pain. He doesn't quite say that, but I think that's part of the effort. You have to make an effort your whole life, um, not to just kind of run away from pain and difficulty, which I think is one of the great things about our, our faith. It can be uh, caricaturized as we make too much of the cross, you know, and, and um, if you can make too much of the cross, you might, I might say we don't make enough of the resurrection, but I don't know if we make too much of the cross. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, okay, so, but yeah, um, we have a great faith in terms of coping with suffering, I think. Um, I have some I have some images that I brought today for, uh, um, I'm getting a little scattered here. Just to sum up, so you know, he was saying, we wanna be able to be these people that can say, it'll be okay, don't be afraid. I, I, I should be reading. He said it's not helpful for him in his position just to hear it. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. He says what we need to hear from you is don't be afraid. Whichever way this thing turns out, I'll stand by you. You know, when I heard him say that, I just kind of, I did. I got more relaxed. I thought that's a beautiful thing to hear, you know. There can be this pressure if you feel like, you know, if we pray hard enough, you'll get better. And of course, we want people to get better. And of course, we pray for them to be relieved of their pain and be healed. You know, but to hear this, whichever way this thing turns out, I'll be with you. I'll stand by you because I love you. Um, and to get to that point, I think, it, like he says, it takes effort. I think of being attentive to our own pain and not running away from ours or other people's and, and being able to, um, I don't know, struggle to love, struggle, struggle to say things that are helpful. And uh, not just by thinking, oh, what should I say? Like you could memorize this. <laughs> well, that's what I should say. But I think first, just being really attentive to your heart and the feelings and being a, trying to empathize with the person you're right next to and, or yourself, uh, getting in touch with your feelings. And then speaking with a loving heart, you know. I think it's sometimes... Uh, uh, It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be, those things that aren't helpful come from from a from a, a fearful heart. What if things won't be okay? I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the pain. I'm afraid of the what you know. And so we say it'll be okay. But if we're not afraid of the pain, if we know it's part of life, if we're not afraid of dying because we know it's part of life, um, then we don't have to like rush to say something that we think will make people feel better. But we can just be present with them, you know. This is a growing edge for me. I, uh, I, and for me, it is a lot of just trying to just live with uncomfortable feelings and uh, sadness and grief, those kind of things, and not just run away from them and forget about them. So, and we all got them. It's not because of anything extraordinary I've experienced. Um, it's just that I think some people do a little bit better. Uh, dealing with the hard emotions and, and others. Maybe it hasn't been modeled real well to us or, or whatever. But it is it is what it is, they say. We just make the best of it and try to be faithful as we go forward. And You know, don't we want to be those kind of people that can be with each other in hard times when we're actually helpful, companion them on the journey in a helpful way? So, anyway. So we started out with... Sober topic. I can just mention a few things for parish news. It's Holy Thursday tomorrow. So the feast before the fast at 5 o'clock at Pizza Ranch if you want to show up. Please be there by 5 if you want the $5 deal where you just give $5 and uh, we'll pick up the rest of the cost. 
It's a nice community event. We have a, um, a room reserved that can hold 72 people. That's been enough. So if you're up for it, it'd be fun to see you. Um, and then Holy Thursday, Mass of the Lord's Supper at 7 o'clock. Uh, I think I can just show you. I'm going to show you this. So, so if you look out the window here, you see our sculpture. All right, can you see that? I got to make... And that's, uh, that's the Last Supper, right? That's Jesus down there at the table with 12 benches that are empty. And uh, when we end the Mass of the Good Supper, Last Supper, we're going to uh, walk out the door over there and then walk on the, on the wider sidewalk just beyond the, 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 the Last Supper sculpture, then walk up that walk on the right, so get really, then get really close to the sculpture and then walk back on the other walkway out. See those, those paving stones? And then walk along the long sidewalk back to the front of church and into the um, gathering space for some time of prayer and meditation. So uh, if people want to stay for that, usually people don't stay for the prayer and meditation, but if you want to, that's a possibility. We can be there. I think we'll, I think we'll keep um, <clears throat> the Eucharist there for prayer till 1030. Then we'll uh, lock things up, okay? Um, so that's Holy Thursday. I do have an image of Holy Thursday. Years ago, I saw this like on a, I don't know, it was like a, an ad for books or something from a publishing house, and they just, they had this up there. I thought, well, that's beautiful. I always thought the foot washing was an important thing. So that's a Holy Thursday. I don't, the only thing about this I'm not crazy about is that, um, I don't think Jesus is really a redhead, but uh, but that's okay. You know, it's a little bit reverse prejudice because I th I think if I if I were in Nigeria or something and they had uh, uh, people with African uh, color skin doing this, I'd say, "Oh, that's great. They're adapting it to their culture." <laughs> but now I see a redhead guy, and I think it's bad because it's not historical. So I'm being a little inconsistent there. So Irish people, I guess, have a right to have Jesus look like them too. Uh, but you can see Peter. See Peter's gruff face there. I'm sorry that reflection of that lamp is. See Peter's gruff face. He's like, ah, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus is like, you got to let me or you'll never get to be part of my kingdom. Well, okay then. <laughs> you know, so. But that's good. So that'll be tomorrow. And we have that nice tradition here. So I'll wash the feet of, um, I think five or six people and then they'll get up and they'll go to stations throughout the church and they will wash someone's feet and whoever's foot is washed by them and they'll get up and they'll wash the next person's feet. It's like a chain reaction. Seems to me since I've been here, maybe half of those who come participate in that. That's pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good uh, percentage. Uh, no pressure. It's not like, uh, you know, they're better than people that, that don't come up and have their feet washed. But it's a nice opportunity to widen the participation of that. So that's will be our Holy Thursday. Uh, good Friday. This isn't Good Friday. This is Palm Sunday. But I wanted to show off. It took me forever to get this thing going the other night. I want to do this every year so I don't forget. And I should start teaching some people. Um, not that others don't know how to do this. But uh, we had a lot of people at uh, Good Friday or Palm Sunday Masses that were making these out of their palms before Mass began. Not, not like this exactly. But I always like these. I always called these helicopters when I was a kid. They looked like a helicopter. But it's a weave and it comes out looking like a cross. The four... This one uh, end was kind of stumpy, so it doesn't look, but it's like four. And uh, the thing is getting the base going, and then the rest is easy. And I, I was in my bed, and it was like on Tuesday already. Was it last night I did this, or two nights ago? Anyway, it was starting to get kind of brittle. I'm like, I got to do this. I wanted to go to sleep. I'm like, no, I got to do this, because tomorrow it's going to be too brittle. So our, our Palm Sunday, I'll find a nice crucifix to put that behind. Um, but Good Friday, then, will be at 1 o'clock, our service. And... Uh, I wanted to show you a couple things, a couple images um, from um, that have to do with the passion of the Lord. This is one of my this is one of my favorite ones. It's it's called um, it's got an interesting title. Greek uh, Greek Orthodox. Um, so you remember in on the Good Friday Passion we proclaimed it said they put a crown of thorns on his head and put a scarlet military cloak around him. This is more earth tones, but 
and then a reed in his hand. So it's to mock him. It's like, oh, you're a king? Okay, here's a crown. How does that feel? You know, ouch, you know, a crown of thorns. Uh, they showed us this tree in the Holy Land on the Mount of Olives. It's called the thorn bush, or I think now they've Christianized it called the crown of thorns bush. But you can see if it was a branch from that tree and just really very long, spiky spikes. Um, and then the reed. Uh, that looks so much like a reader now that he's holding, but that really touched me when we were proclaiming that on Sunday. That they, you know, they just mocked him so much. They made here's like, here's like a royal scepter. It's like this flimsy reed they put in his hand, and then it said that they, you know, they mocked him, they spit at him, and it said they um, tapped him on the head with the reed. So it's like here's your scepter, and then they and they took it away and just started like hitting him on the head with it, and uh, like the suffering servant, he just he just took it, you know. He just took all that. Uh, it was time for him to be passive. There was a time for him to be active, and uh, he would defend the poor, and he would lay into hypocritical people that were saying they were so religious but weren't caring for one another. So he could be strong when he needed to, but he was entering in his passion here, and uh, uh, it was time for him just to just to kind of take it, you know, and not uh, open not his mouth. And the title of this is the Bridegroom. So in Greek Orthodox theology, the, the great high point isn't so much the resurrection, it's the crucifixion. And it's, it's when he marries humanity. It's when, it's when he goes to the depth of the human experience and actually weds himself to the human race in our suffering and our death. And, and he comes out of it, of course, uh, raised to life again and, and calls us to live with him. But this, uh, so they call this the bridegroom, actually. Isn't that interesting? So, um, this, if you can see this or not, that darn reflection will probably make it hard. But this was made by a man that I visited in jail. Um, I think you can kind of tell what it is, can't you? It's Mary holding... Jesus, and you probably recognize that it's kind of a famous. So this guy used to, you know, it was a case where he just, well, he did an awful thing and he wasn't really in his right mind and he was in jail and, and uh, but he had deep faith through it all. And he, he pretty much painted, drew this with pencil on a piece of paper a guard gave him from memory. And uh, I don't know, I was just very impressed. I was very touched that he would give it to me. Um, and he, he used to, um, he would just do his art on little napkins and paper towels from the bathroom and stuff. And then a guard had mercy on him and said, here's a sheet of paper. And he came up with this. Uh, so this is very precious. This is hanging in our, uh, dining room, our, our, a meeting room that we have in the parish center. Um, and that's of course called the Pieta. It's based on... <clears throat> Right, so maybe you've seen this. This looks good in this light. There's no awful reflection. Um, so, and this, of course, is a is a little miniature replica of the famous Pietà by Michelangelo, the original of which is at St. Peter's in Rome. You walk in the big main doors there off the square, turn to the right, and you'd see this. There was kind of a um, mentally ill person. <sighs> Gosh, was it 30, 40 years ago now? Who rushed it with a chisel and kind of hammered away at it? And I think did damage it a little bit. So now it's kind of behind a plexiglass kind of screen to protect it. You know, where else you can see a life-size um, copy of the original is at St. Paul Cathedral in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, same kind of location. You walk in the big doors off the steps with downtown on the other side, and then you turn right, and there's this beautiful sculpture of the Pieta. But... Um, so a lot of feeling there, huh? Mary holding uh, the dead body of her son. And uh, Good Friday, huh? We hold the death of the Lord deep in our hearts. Yeah. Um, so that's our Good Friday. We'll have that at one o'clock. And then uh, um, we'll take a Good Friday collection, by the way, that always goes to the needs of churches in the Holy Land. Uh, you know, just being back from there, 
I can say it's, it's well used. There's lots of shrines and the Franciscans are given charge of that and most of the money collected. I read that $9 million gets collected. That was what was collected last year, you know, to try to maintain these churches, these holy places, because they're not really, um, they're not really parishes. You know, Christians in the Holy Land are getting fewer and fewer. Thank God there are still a bunch and there's some active parishes, but um, they do rely on money coming from outside to kind of keep things going. Um, so that's what our Good Friday collection is for. Um, then we have Easter Vigil. We have a baptism of an adult, Nathan, and then four uh, receptions and confirmations. So that'll be, that'll be great. Oh, I did want to show you this other image I have of the crucifixion. <clears throat> so I like this. I got this from a good friend of mine who lives in Europe. He lives in the Netherlands. And um, he's one of these guys, he's very thoughtful. Uh, when he visits other people, he comes bearing gifts. So he visited me with his children uh, a couple summers ago. And he gave me this <laughs> as a present. He said, yeah, I bought it in an antique store. I thought I thought of you, I thought you might like it. I'm like, oh, well. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's a glazed pottery kind of deal, except the body is not glazed. I don't know if you can tell. So it's kind of, everything is sort of shiny except the body, which is just the kind of the raw pottery. Then on the back, there's some writing. And it's in uh, Dutch. So I don't know Dutch. So I kind of gave up with it. Then I remembered the other day, Christine's mother is from, was born in Holland. She was raised in Holland. She speaks Dutch. So I say, hey, Christine, can you uh, show this to your mom? And she did. And, um, and she could read most of it. It's in pencil. It's a little hard to read. But it's a gift um, to a young person. Um, and I, I could read. I read the date. It says 7 4 46. So it's, it's pretty old, right? 1946. And she said, and I think I think this might even have been the case with, with like my parents. My parents would be in their 90s now. My mom's still living. Um, but you made your first communion and then you made a solemn first communion like later. Anybody heard of that before? It's like you might do your first communion when you're seven and then do your solemn first communion when you're 12 or something like that. And, and um, anyway, Christine's mother, Johanna, read that and said, this is a gift for the solemn, a solemn first communion. And uh, anyway, I was showing this to the class, the classroom. I took this into the, I took both of these, this and this, into the uh, classrooms. Oh, I can tell you something about this in a minute, <clears throat> but into the classrooms to just show them a little show and tell. Uh, I don't always know what to do with our, our little kids when I go in the classrooms, but it, show and tell always seems to work pretty well. Hangman once they learn how to read. Um, but so. I'm telling the story about this, and then I'm realizing, I go, so this is the date, uh, let's see, 7 4 46. That would be, you know, July 4th, 1946. Except in Europe, they do it different, right? They reverse the month and the day. So it would mean um, April 7th, 7 4 is the is seven's not the, the month, it's the day. So it's the 7th of April, 1946. And I'm like, and we're talking about the cross, we're talking about Good Friday. And I said, you know what? Guess what April 7th is this year, the date on here? It's Good Friday. Now, I'm telling them all about the cross. And I said, this date on here, to this year, not in 1946, but in 2023, is Good Friday. I just thought that was a lovely coincidence. They thought it was pretty cool too. I was in Miss Rosine's classroom when I came up with that. I, little discovery, so anyway. Then we have Easter Vigil and Easter coming up. And of course, I love this. We have an image of this in the back of our church hanging from the choir loft, if you ever go out. I like how you, you can walk into St. James from the back and you look up front and you see the, um, the cross, the beautiful cross, which now is fully equipped with both nails in Jesus' hands. Uh, and um, and so you you know you hold that deep in your heart and and uh, the sacrifice Christ made for the salvation of the world hanging over altar. But then on the way out, you see this. You see Jesus victorious over death, pulling an Adam and Eve out of their graves, having kicked down the doors of death. And you see all the hinges and nails and stuff and the blackness there. It's because he kicked down the doors of hell. 
and he's pulling Adam and Eve out. And there's some of the saints around him. There's Moses and King David and John the Baptist. And, and uh, I forget who the others are right now, but some of the, the great saints. And then that character, that poor character there that's all bound up, that's, that's, that's supposed to be the personification of death. Some people say it's Satan. The more I've read about it, they say it's just, it's just the death. It's like death is beaten down. He's wrapped up death and tied it up victorious over death. So there's a lot to celebrate in three days, huh? Holy Thursday and all that. Just on the lighter side of things, Holy Thursday and all that, I, I don't mean to be glib. It's, it's who was it, Patrice at, at church today saying, if you really want to tell his children, if you really want to understand, oh, Christine, I think, if you really want to understand Christianity, go to church on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Vigil and try to live that out. And enter into that story. Oh. I'll just share this with you. So I don't know if you can see this. <clears throat> There's a crack. Where is it? Yeah. Can you see there's a crack there? Maybe you can't. I don't know if I can see it on the camera. Anyway, there's a crack right here. And if you look at on the front, there's a crack right kind of across Mary's neck. I don't know if you, I can't see it on my screen, but maybe you can see it on yours. Well, you know what happened? My brothers and I were playing football in the living room, which of course is like wrong, wrong thing to do. This was always on an end table next to the sofa in the living room. And the ball hit it and hit and it knocked Mary's head off. Can you believe it? And so I'm really grateful that you can hardly tell. Mom was able to, uh, to glue her right back on. And we have a nice uh, pieta to continue to. Uh... Now it's in my living room, so except right now. Anyway, so a little bit uh, Holy Week. Um, hope uh, you found some of this interesting at least. I hope you can make this week holy by prayer, by uh, entering into the scriptures, having some quiet time to savor your faith. It's a beautiful, beautiful faith we have. It just, it just really is a dying and rising and Eucharist, our rituals, um, service, washing the feet. There's just so much that can speak to our experience of people trying to find communion with God and communion with each other. So let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for our lives. We pray for those who are hurting. We ask you to help us come to grips with the difficulty of life and not run from it. But try to understand it and try to take it to you when we're hurting. Help us grow in faith and be able to endure pain with faith so that we can be really good companions to each other, that we can say to each other, however this thing turns out, I'll stand with you because I love you. Help us not be afraid of pain or death because you have entered both and shown us the way out. We praise your risen life in our world. Okay, God bless you everybody. Happy Holy Week and blessed Easter when it comes.